warm welcome thank you for joining the pilot episode thank you so much for joining um i hope that cheers woke you up so in behalf of the nilds hub of innovation for inclusion and power max center we would like to welcome everyone to the pilot episode live ed live ed is a series of creative master classes for for basic education teachers and today's pilot episode is about storyfying Storifying any kind of content. Uh, you heard it right. This is a series, so we there will be more episodes up ahead. So um, I would like to invite everyone to stay until the end, wherein we will share what's up ahead. Okay. So today is special because this is a pilot episode, and we're very much uh, honored to be partnered with Power Max Center. So Live Ed is has spontaneously been created. So this is a birth in the pandemic um, out of a felt need that you know our, our, our operations has been hugely disrupted. Um, face-to-face learning is something that we cannot deliver so everything is um, online, delivered online for now. So Live Ed is a baby of the pandemic and because we feel that this is a, a clear and present challenge that we all share whether we're basic education or higher education and even in companies no so we feel that this is um a clear and present need um hi-fi being a social innovation hub what we do is uh, we look at the challenges that we have around us and we try our best to create new ways of doing things and activate action around it so um live ed is one proof of that activation that we hope to be able to share with you so we are very grateful to find a partner and collaborator with Power Max Center. Both our organizations, High Five, the NIL, and, and Power Max Center, we both believe that learning is limitless. It's not bound. And we also feel that we can proactively shape the future of this learning. What does this learning look like? So this is an effort to do that. Brother Dennis? Yeah. Anything from your end? Well, from my end here in Hong Kong, for those of you who don't know that I am here, uh, I'm, I'm the last part here before you see our, our session already. So today, to give you an idea why we use Live Ed, for those of you who are in the 80s, Live Aid. Remember Live Aid? Well, it's a time <laughs> that they, they wanted to help. This is also our Live Ed. It's just pronounced in the, maybe a Filipino way. Uh, <laughs> It's, a, it's an opportunity for, for our friends to share with the basic education, the, the, to share <laughs> live aid, friends, mm-hmm. to share their uh, gifts, their, their, their skills, their talents with you during this time. So today, as uh, one such creative person, and he really looks like an actor, artist, Poging Pogi, which reminds us of, in the 80s, Subas Herrero. Okay. <laughs> Suba Serrero, those of you who know him, Champuy, Champuy, Ibang Iba, Champuy, something to that effect, no? Uh, but of course, uh, he's the younger, younger version of this who will be sharing with us today. Uh, but for you who's, who knew, uh, who heard me singing that, you know my age already at this point. So kidding aside, we're honored to have the founder and former chair of the digital filmmaking program of De La Salle College of St. Benil. He has 20 years of ex- teaching experience and almost 30 years of experience in TV, film, media production. So he's earned his master's degree in cross-disciplinary art and design at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and is a staunch advocate of technology-enhanced progressive teaching and learning. Guys and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our mentor and master for today, Jack Garcia. Hi, everybody. Thanks, bro. Then, uh, good morning, Abby. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody here. Uh, I'm off. I'm super serero, talaga. Yeah, you date yourself, okay? Pwede naman Alec Baldwin, de ba? Can can we get oh, can we get a vote in the chat, talaga? Na? Okay. Yeah, de ba? Can we get a vote on the chat for Alec Baldwin rather than uh, super serero? Uh, so that being said and that, good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to uh, to the first, the pilot episode of uh, Live Ed. Uh, thanks so much for Power, to Power Max Center for having me here today and uh, of course the Hub of Innovation for Inclusion. Uh, okay, 
uh, I guess let's just get this ball rolling, okay? Uh, so I will now be, I'll just be switching streams right now. But in the meantime, while I'm switching streams, I just like to remind everyone that I teach fast and I talk faster. So if there's anything that you don't seem to catch or you miss out during the the lecture feel free to just pop that into the chat or uh, and and the the team behind the camera uh, the high fi team is gonna you know moderate those questions and eventually get it there if there's some really big thing that totally missed out pop that in the chat so that they can ask me to repeat and uh you know to kind of backtrack because internet is kind of clunky today right but everybody's worried if everybody is busy checking their profiles or fake accounts. Okay, so here we go then. I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. See? See, and now I'm getting votes for Alec Paul doing union news. But thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your support. Okay, so uh, here we go. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're now going to be talking about stories and using stories, building stories, leveraging stories. Uh, for your classroom needs, okay? So, let's get started. Stories in the classroom. Now, just to, make, just to be clear, uh, I am not inventing this or anything. There is such a thing called narrative-based theory. And in narrative-based learning, narrative-based theory is a learning model grounded in the theory that humans define their experiences within the context of narratives. So, the the, the Simplest, the fastest, the, the most, the most concrete way that I can that I can explain what this line means is think of a creation story, and I'm not just talking about the Christian creation story because all cultures, ancient uh, and modern, have a creation story. So whether it's Malakas and Maganda, Adam and Eve, or some other creation story, there, there, the the way that we that we as humans, as ancient humans, began to understand why are we here, why are we different from cows and chickens and and, and bears. It's, is because you know is why you know why do we so have to explain that a creation story was created was was developed was told and what uh, what what they do what these uh, what these narratives do they're cognitive structures stories are cognitive structures they are means of communication uh, and and they aid people in framing and understanding their perceptions of the world. So again, the easiest way that we understand what goes on around us is when something is storified. Okay, so this is what narrative-based learning is telling us. Now, from a from a more constructivist sense, uh, narratives, stories, they, they they create scaffolds for us to understand abstract concepts. So this cloudy thing, this abstract thing, it's a story that gives the structure to it and gives it solid. Okay. Uh, constructive learning here says, theorizes that active learning takes place within the context in which the knowledge must be applied. So again, it's reinforcing the fact that a story helps us understand and helps our learners understand what is going on. Also, there are other uh, or uh, additional things in constructive learning that anchored instruction is a type of situation that presents students with a realistic narrative within a specific context. And in this context, there is a problem that must be solved by applying knowledge. Okay? So, so again, you know, we're here today, we're talking about storification and all of that. This is not just about, uh, you know, fictionalizing everything that, uh, that we're doing, but there's actually a very solid, very strong pedagogical uh, undertone or, or foundation to narrative in the classroom. All right. Okay. Excellent. Here we go. Let's 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 get the ball rolling while we're at it. Okay. In a couple of seconds, uh, you will be distributed into breakout rooms. And when you go to the breakout rooms, when you get when you get back there, I want you to switch on your cameras and your microphone. And what I want you to do is just simply introduce yourselves to others in the room. This is the getting to know you activity. Okay. I. I want you to, to to shake hands with the person sitting beside you and all of that. So you have 30 seconds, just 30 seconds, very fast. I want you to give them your name, where are you from, and more importantly, what is happening to you today or what's happening in your life today that prompted, motivated, pushed you, or made you attend today's webinar, 
Okay, again, well, your name, where you're from, I'm Jad, I'm from Manila, and what is happening to you today that prompted, motivated, pushed you, and made you attend today's webinar. So I'm saying, you know, I'm an extrovert, and uh, this whole quarantine thing for two and a half months, almost three months, has been driving me crazy. So now I'm looking for a way to connect with people once again. So I joined this webinar, or I helped organize the accepted invitation for this webinar. Simple as that, 30 seconds or less. Okay, and then automatically you will be uh, booted back into this room after I think it's about seven, ten minutes. Uh, we're giving everybody 30 seconds to, to, to do their thing, plus or minus one or two minutes for people to connect in and out. Okay, all right. So uh, we're back, aren't we? So let's let's continue on. Now, what what is that you guys experienced uh, when you introduced yourselves and you told people what it, uh, you know, why or what motivated you to come? Uh, to today's webinar, uh, you were telling uh, you were telling people a story, and 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 that that's where we begin. Okay, this is really what what this whole webinar is about: storytelling. So, what is storytelling? Storytelling is the conveying of events in words and images, often using improvisation and embellishment. Okay, and let's uh, you know allow me to 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 break this down even further. First of all, the conveying of events. And uh, it sounds very elementary, it sounds a very duh, but when nothing is happening, there's nothing to tell. For in Filipino, pag walang nangyayari, wala kang ikakwento. So it, it sounds very, very, very basic, but you have to understand that if you want to tell a story, something has to happen or something has to be happening. Now these, these events are conveyed in words or images. What it means is that you're not limited to just text. Yes, you can use text, but you can use words, you can use pictures, you can use cinema, you can use music, you can use dance, you can use action, facial expression. You can, there are so many ways of telling a story. You do not need to always, you don't have to write it down. If you're not a writer, you don't need to write. So, uh, and then the third part of this definition is often using improvisation and embellishment. And this is probably the most, uh, the most crucial or the more important one here. Uh, it's improvisation and embellishment. Improvisation, what's it called improvisation? The first is improvisation. The simplest way I can explain that is using one thing in place of another. Using one place in place, one thing in place of another. It's not necessarily a metaphor, but you're using an object to replace another object, for instance. Or you're going to use, uh, I'm going to use the tone of my voice to, to to put to, to to replace the drama of what happened or the excitement of what happened to me earlier. I'll use the tone of my voice. So I'll improvise. Okay. Next is embellishment. Embellishment is similar to improvisation, but embellishment now is the Hollywoodie. Uh, it is making things more interesting. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, is that real life is boring. The, regardless of how dramatic we think a, a personal experience is, it is boring. So what we do when we tell a story, we want to be engaging. We want people to listen to us or to, to attach to our story. If we embellish, we kind of, you know, Hollywood is, we, we, add, we add the explosions. We make it bigger. We put, we put the artista, you know. So, so again, so when you tell a story, you tell events, you convey events. You use words, images, actions, music, dance, movement, and you use improvisation, and you embellish it. You make it bigger. Okay? So that's, that's the premise of storytelling. Now, where's my mouse? There we go. Okay? Now, another thing about stories that we have to understand when we're telling stories is that, is that uh, they affect us in a different manner than just simple facts. You'll see here in this diagram, okay, that facts speak to your mind. And story speaks to your heart. Fact, if I tell you one plus one is equal to two, it's a it's a fact. You cannot you cannot change that. You cannot you cannot counter that. So it just speaks to the mind. It, it it registers in our mind. But when you tell a story, for instance, the people that you were talking to earlier in the breakout groups were telling it, and then the the lady uh, Miss Miss Coson uh, who with me in my breakout room earlier, she was saying that she's a mom. She actually she's not a teacher, but she wanted to attend this because she has had to take over uh, some of the functions of the school to teach her children because of this whole pandemic thing. So that's just a simple story.
story and she's telling me that yes, it resonates with me, so it speaks to the heart. We connect now on something much more than just the mind. And of course, you know, all of us, we've, we've, uh, we've done something that was emotion-based. But what do you remember more? You know, the, the lecture on calculus that you were taught 20-something years ago in school or that first crush who denied you 30 years ago? Chances are it's the first crush who denied you or broke your, broke your heart because that, that, that affected you. It doesn't actually last longer. Okay? The heart might not be the smartest organ in your body. It's, it's the one that remembers the most. So when you tell a story, it speaks here. Let it well facts speak here. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that when you tell a good story, you spark interest, you spark an emotion. Good stories surprise the audience. You know, surprises is probably, <gasps> it's not like that. But surprises, you know, oh, really? Oh, I learned something new. Or, you know, or your mind starts to open up. Or they start to learn something. They start to pick up things. So a good story can do things like persuade because, because people start to, to, to see what's going on, to, 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 to resonate, to, to, to connect, okay? Good stories inspire action, okay? Good stories inspire action. Facts, ladies and gentlemen, inspired nothing. Now, I'm not discounting facts here, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Just to be real, facts are necessary, okay? Facts are facts are facts. But if you want to inspire action, if you want to create an emotional connection, if you want to, to get things going, use a story or envelop your, your, your story around your facts so that people start to connect with it and do something. Remember, good stories inspire action. Okay? In the classroom, ladies and gentlemen, there are so many different kinds of stories that you can use, okay? Anecdotal stories, for instance. And uh, these are you know, stories about something that had happened. Fictional stories. So not all stories have to be truthful. They can be fictional, you know. They can be fictional. They can be metaphorical. Again, using one thing in place of another. Examples here would be parables, for instance, or maybe Aesop's fables are metaphorical. Analogous. You're using a story to parallel the, the learning moment that you're trying to communicate. So your, your story is going side by side with your with the development of your learning. Then there is personal or reflective. So using a your own story, your personal story or a personal story of somebody else to cause a reflection, to cause uh, people to think. And then uh, pre-existing stories, of course, stories that already exist, these are fictional, non-fictional. And then there are interactive stories where your students or your learners and you, you build a story as you go along. And so a story doesn't always have to be pre-written. A story can happen as it is being, uh, can be, you know, can be built on the spot or while they're being told they're being built. So I like what they call a continuing story. Okay. I just saw one here in the chat uh, from Teacher Nikki. Facts can be story but to inspire action. In. Yes. Facts on their own do not inspire action. But when you storyify those facts, then you cause something to happen. Then you create movement. Then you create action. Okay? So, when we're talking about stories, okay, there are five basic elements to a story. Okay? Uh, setting character, goal, conflict, and theme. Now, let's get, uh, I'll go through this in order. So, we'll try to. Yeah, if you have your tools, your people have their pen tools open. Somebody's drawing on my wall. So, uh, so that being said, okay, let's start with, with setting. Okay, setting is where your story happens. So, setting creates context. Okay, uh, it can be a time setting, it can be a location setting, and and so setting, okay? So that, that should be fairly clear. I'm putting that there because that's where we take that one out of the way. The next is character, goal, and conflict. And when we're talking about character, goal, and conflict, I'll show you this slide next. Okay? This is how I'd like you to visualize what, what, what we mean by character, goal, and conflict, okay? Or character, goal, and challenge. Your character, your, your, your object here on the left, okay? It's a... Uh, 
is the is it, is it what your is the person or the thing the object that moves your story that, that allows your story to move okay so you need a character your character doesn't have to be human your character can be an object or can be a, a, a an animal you know but uh, it, this is this is what the move. This is the thing that moves. If you're thinking a chess piece, this is the chess piece that your characters. Okay, your character needs a goal. Now, when you're when you're defining a goal, when you're creating a goal for your for your character, please remember that your goal has to be physical. It has to be a concrete goal. It has to you have to be able to knock on it. You have to be able to lift it because your goal has to be achievable or not achievable. Physical, uh, through love world peace forever are not goals okay so so yung mga so yung mga umaasa dyan that your goal is to find your forever or is to find is to have forever no there is no such thing as that wala pong forever wala pong true love uh your goal has to be concrete so when you're creating a story the character the object of your or the, the goal of your character should not be world peace it should be to uh, to make these two warring factions come to a truce, because then you're able to say whether your character has succeeded or failed. Okay, you understand? So we uh, your your goals should not be concepts. All right. Next, what's your challenge? The challenge is what's keeping your character from achieving from achieving that goal. This is what is going to to keep us from making an automatic success. And it is the challenge that causes people to to to, to listen to your stories, to become compelled by your stories. But listeners, students, audiences, they they kind of know what's going to happen in the end. But people want your character to try because it gives them a reason to care. Okay, it, uh, once again. Your audiences want your character to try because it gives them a reason to care. So that's your character, your goal, and your challenge. Now, that's the fifth one, theme. Theme, ladies and gentlemen, is what your story is about. This is the concept. So if we're going to be talking about... Um, the ace of fable, well, you know, the uh, the fox and the crane. That's when where the crane was putting in uh, pebbles into a tall jar and all of that. The goal was to drink from the jar, from the from the base. But the theme is knowing about you know ingenuity and play and being smart in how you in how you deal with problems. So so the theme is the concept. This is now the soft theme. This is now the true love and the and the forever. And the world pieces. Okay, I will revisualize that again. This is how you, how how we should be understanding character, goal, conflict, and setting. Character, goal, conflict, and setting. These are your variables. So for the math teachers here, this should make sense. These are your variables. These are the things that change. These are the things that you can move around. Your theme is also a variable, but it is from a you know it is an independent variable. If my terminology is correct. But it is from another set, your theme. Now, your variables of your character goes with role content and setting plus your theme is your story. Okay? Your story happens in that in that intersection between character, goal, content, and setting and your theme. Okay? So that's what's making sense so far, or we're good. Okay. Now let's go on to that next slide. All right. So what I'm presenting to you here, what I'm showing to you here right now, uh, ladies and gents, it's a very, very simple, uh, very, very straightforward framework that you can use. The, S the SWS or someone wanted something or somebody wanted something strategy in creating a story. And I want you to take a photo of it or I want you to copy it down. Uh, or download it, screen share it, or something. But it's a, it's a very, very simple strategy. Basically, somebody who is your main character wanted, what's, what's your goal? So what does your character want to do? But, now this is your conflict, this is your challenge. But what is keeping your character from achieving that goal? So, what happened? 
this is the journey. I wanted to cross the street, but there are a lot of cars crossing. So I went to the corner where there is a crosswalk. Then, then this is now the, the ending. How do we, how do we, what, what do you want to happen in the very end of that story? So what's the result? I went to my, uh, I went to my, to the corner and I was able to cross properly when the walk sign set up. That's, that's, that's a simple. Now, is this going to finish writing your story? No, this is not necessarily going to finish writing your story, but this is where you start. Once you have this as second nature to yourself, then you're able to form your stories quickly, even without a piece of paper, because now you're now you understand the process. Somebody wanted something, but so then. Okay. Now I want you to take a screen tap of this or write this down quickly or put something together because this, this is now activity number two. Okay. I will give you five minutes. Okay, maybe less. But what I want you to do is, uh, this is solo, okay? This is not a breakout activity. I want you to, uh, I want you to, to write out the, the, uh, a simple story. And the topic of that story is I want you to just be something that you teach every day. Something, bam, you know, the first topic that comes to your head. Write about that, okay? Or write a story about it or story by it. Uh, 25 limits, 25 word limits per column. Okay, we have five columns, so this is, we're talking 125 words maximum. I will give you five minutes. All right? Are there any questions? Okay, so this is individual. Uh, we'll put that there, and then I will answer the question of, uh, of Mike V on the chat. Can you put conflict before goals? Yes, you may. Yes, you may. It is not an order. It is. Uh, the order that you saw, that the kind of visualization is just a, it's a mnemonic. That you have your character in one place, the goal is the target, and that keeping the person from reaching the target is the conflict or the challenge. But yes, you may put your challenge at the beginning. We're back? Okay. Because I lost my, I lost my panels. I don't know what people are back anymore. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's continue. Let's, uh, let's continue. <laughs> now, uh, how do we write an engaging story? Okay, uh, this is this is the writing part because for many of us, uh, you know, the difference between telling a story and writing it is two totally different things. And sometimes people have to write them down to be able to tell a story properly. And uh, this this uh, this story arc, this spray tag triangle, it should be fairly familiar to us. It's called in the beginning, middle, end, three act structure. Uh, and, and you've got your writing action and all of these things. So, but you know, I'll just show quickly what you're supposed to be about. Your beginning, your act one, your opening sequences. It's where you introduce your character, you establish a backstory or a premise or a situation, and you kick off the problem. This is this is when you build up to to okay, this is when, this is now the so there. Or you know, somebody wanted something, so this is now what they do. Okay? In act two, in the middle, this is the bulk of your story. This is the problem solving process. Remember that your character needs to get something done. So this is now the process of getting that thing done. Then they overcome challenges, conflict, conflict, conflict. You know, conflict moves the story. Remember, conflict moves the story. Without your character overcoming conflict, then they, they do not progress. The story does not progress. And your third act, your 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 denouement. Yeah, this is overcoming your ultimate challenge, the realizations and transformations that happen, and then coming to terms with the decisions that you make. So this is your basic story structure, no? But the thing is, and a lot of us are very familiar with that. We've been learning it in grade school. Many of us, especially the English and Filipino teachers here, teach it. But what, but what usually we don't get to teach or we've not taught or we fail to teach is this important little blue arrow here below, and there's transformation, and transformation is a change. Something has to change from the beginning of the story compared to the end of the story. It can be a physical transformation. When we talk about, for example, the life cycle of a butterfly and the transformation of the caterpillar to a butterfly, that's a physical transformation. That's valid. That's a transformation. It can be a psychological transformation on how we think or how the character thinks. It can be a, an environmental transformation. For instance, in the film 2012, for instance, or a lot of these uh, you know, the day after tomorrow, the story is about how the earth changes and how people cope. So there's an environmental change. 
So, but it's important. So this story is compelling and something actually happened. There has to be a change between what happened in the beginning and what happened to the end. Okay, so don't forget that arrow below there, huh? the transformation. Now I'm presenting to you my uh, classroom story quick tip, okay? Uh, that's royalty free, copyrighted, et cetera, et cetera, but that's yours, you can use it. Uh, this is a quick tip. This is, I'm going to run through a fairly, fairly easy, fairly um, just fill in the blank sort of thing so that you can fill, you, can, you have a formula to follow when you're building a story. Now, it has five parts, the hook, the setup, the run, the big moment, and the resolution. In the resolution, you have two options, the edge or the end. And you will see in the diagram here uh, on your right that the edge kind of picks up once again while the end. Jack? Yes, you don't see my screen? I'm asking if they're sharing your screen. Are you sharing? Yeah, I am. I, uh, I, I, not, hope. Not showing. I hope I am. It's not showing. Okay, let's do that one more time. Thank you. Uh, no, no worries, no worries. My bad. Let. Oh, you're going to see my PowerPoint deck. Oh. <laughs> let's click on that. What? Okay, so where was I? So anyway, here, this, this, this is the beginning, middle, end thing. The whole time, okay? And then the transformation that I'm talking about. And for even greater import, as I said, this is the story quick tip that I want to share with you. It's made up of five parts, hook, setup, run, big moment, and the resolution. And you'll see the resolution over here. Uh, there's the edge, which kind of picks up again, and then the end where we finish the story. Now, how do we use this? How does it work? How do these... Uh, how do these things work together? Let me just what my brain has Okay. The hook. The hook is the hook is your the hook as the term implies. Hooks in your audience and reels them in. It it captures them. It, it grabs their interest. So you, what you want is is you have something say, bam, you know, it's something interesting, something whoa, what happened there? What is that about? And you're only given or I'm only giving you when you're writing this out, one to two sentences. Of course, if you're writing a, you know, George R. R. Martin novel of, uh, or, you know, Harry Potter books, you know, obviously you don't just write two sentences, but this is your proportion. Your hook has to be short and sweet and sharp because when it grabs your audience, it pulls them in and they do not get to escape. So come up with an interesting hook. Start with that. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, Herman Melville's uh, movie Dick. For instance, opening line, call me Ishmael. It's a quote. Right there, they introduce you know, the, 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 the the characters immediately introduced, and he says, Call me Ishmael. Okay. Now we have a personal relationship. You are hooked as a reader. In three words. See? So uh, after you're hooked, okay, you now go into your setup. Now your setup now is your as the term implies, you know, starts to starts to kind of set the scene. Uh, three to five sentences on the average, no more than seven. You want to establish your premise, what's going on, where things are going. This, there's a great danger here, ladies and gentlemen, of putting in so many unnecessary details, so much backstory. So what happens is you're overloading your story with so much information that may or may not be relevant as the, as the story progresses. So be very careful. So I'm think, thinking three to five sentences, no more than seven. Establish your main characters or establish your, your main theme. Set up. Remember that you're kicking off the problem. Then we go into the run. This is now your, your variable. Uh, you'll see at the bottom, it's a 75 to 80% of your story. I'm not giving you a sentence count for this, but this is now where the bulk happens. This is where you narrate the journey of your character. This is where you try to achieve the goal or overcome the challenges that's going on. You know, oh, there's a dragon on the wall. Attack the dragon. You know, this is where it happens. What you're trying to do here is you're building up towards your big moment, your climax. But I don't want to call it a climax. This is your big moment. Okay? You're building up towards that. So, so work towards, remember, build up. Every word that you put, every sentence that you put, every paragraph that you put, every action, every, every emotion should be a ladder that builds up to your big moment. 
when you get to your big moment, okay, this is now your cru most crucial point of your story. This is the peak of the story. This is the brink of failure or disaster for your uh, for your character. Okay, it's a brink of failure. They will fail, or if they don't do something now, they will fail. So this is also when you start to contain your big life point. This is when you start to insert your 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 whoa. This is when I apply knowledge into the into understanding the context or into you know, translating that into classroom sense. This is where the no my as a listener, my knowledge comes in. So your your character now is given a decision point, or the story takes a decision point. Three sentences max. You're, you're, if you're spending two or three days ex explaining how exciting your your climax is, then your climax is not exciting. So three sentences max. After that, you now have two options. You know, you're at the peak, right? So as you go down, you now have two options. You have two places to go. And this is your choice as a storyteller or the purpose that you need your story to be told in the classroom viewpoint. One is open up the resolution through a question, which means that people, students now, your audiences now explore ending, explore what results. Okay, so open ended. Well, now this is the open ended type. Uh, the rest, the other one is the end, where you, for you as the storyteller, provide the ending. You provide the learning point. You may know, provide closure. And there is a reason for that as well. Sometimes you have to end the story because that's what the story is. That 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 with the ending. Okay, so there's an identified result or consequence from the decisions that are being made. So going back to my diagram, again, this is your quick tip, right? You have your hook, you grab them, reel them in, set up, notice how it goes down, how it dips, so, oh, exciting. And then now we take the time to set up. Then now we run, go, 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 you know, issues, go challenge it, overcome, 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 until finally you have your big moment. Your big climactic moment. This is when you think, "Oh no, you're gonna fail. My character is gonna fail." Makes a decision, and then that decision turns towards the end, so that resolution and how you resolve that depends on what you need your story for, or how you're going to apply it in the classroom. Okay. So, how do you tell or use an engaging story? Now, this is also one of those things that you want to photograph or screen cap or something. These are nine pretty fairly easy tips for storytelling in the classroom. First of all, is have a hero and an enemy. Now, do you always need a kalaban, a, 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 a bad guy? No, you don't always need a bad guy. But when I say have a hero and enemy, have a, have a, have a character, like your hero, your vida, and have that, have what's that stopping that, that person from getting there, the enemy. It can be society, it can be a thought, it can be a, a mindset. But there is something that is keeping your hero from achieving your goal. All right? Then use conflict, you know, because now you have an enemy, you use conflict. Remember that stories only move forward when your character overcomes a conflict. Third, omit any irrelevant details. This is why I gave you a sentence budget earlier, because you want to try hard to avoid things that are not necessary so that you can focus on telling the story. And when you tell the story, use the language that you use. Talk like, tell the story like you talk. Do not, do not consciously shift into some other persona when you're telling a story because then your listeners already know you're being fake. Now you're saying, that, oh, but what if there's voice acting and all that? There's voice acting. Because now, you know, P, five, O, oh, fam, I smell the blood of an Englishman. That's fine. I am now playing the role of a giant. But when I'm telling my story, I'm also telling you the way I talk. Do not adopt a do not adopt a, a role that you are not familiar with because your audiences will, will focus on the fakeness of your storytelling. And a fake story is not compelling. You can tell a fictional story, but never tell a fake story. Okay? Next, make it visual. Oh, do I need to draw? Do I need to use pictures? Do I need to use movies? No. Make it visual. Tell a story that people see what's going on in their head. Describe things. Use color in your language. Use, use shapes in your language. Use emotion. Use hand gestures. Use facial expressions. So it's visual. It's not just oral. Next is make it personally easy to relate to. Talk about things that you understand. Understand that you hear. That you know. 
because then it's personal and, and people get to relate to it. Understand who you're telling your story to. If you're telling a story to two year olds, it's different from telling a story from a 20 year old. Or as I told my breakout group earlier, for instance, the difference between preschoolers, teaching preschoolers, and teaching college students is preschoolers have better penmanship. Okay? Now, make sure that there's a transformation. That's number seven. Make sure that something changes because, it, because that's what makes your story interesting and compelling. Add spice, metaphor, action, voice, humor, you know, if I can use visual, use your hands, use your voice, tell, you know, make it interesting, make it fun, make it funny. Throw in some, some humor, humor things every now and then because it, it brings up the humanity in your, in your audience. Okay? And last and very important, have clear learning moments. You should be able to pick up your, uh, your, you know, very clearly your learning moment. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share a story. I'm going to share you quickly a story. And what I want you to do is just listen, okay? And the title of this is The Parable of the Perfect Project. Um, I call it the parable just also to say that, you know, parables were used in the Bible, were used by Christ, to, to explain concepts. So if you want a case for storification, parables. He didn't lecture about you do this, you do that, you do that. No, he told the story in a parable. And it, it allowed you know, to construct and understand how things work. Right? All right. So the parable of the perfect project. Okay. Now this, this, is, uh, this story happened or, or was born about teaching for 18 years ago, more or less, 17 years ago. And so uh, when I was teaching in this school, uh, we had, the school I was teaching in, I, you know, um, had the unfortunate reputation at the time, 17 years ago, 20 years ago, had the unfortunate reputation of not being that good. Okay? And I knew that going into the school, but, you know. And this, the thing is, what I discovered, the part that, that, the part that I discovered when I was in the school was that, uh, was, it wasn't just the outside world, outsiders saying that the school wasn't very good or that the students weren't very smart. I found out that the school itself said that the students weren't very smart. The school itself was saying that the students were not all that. Now, the thing is, you know, this school actually hired some really good teachers, really smart teachers, real, you know, real go-getters. And the teachers would be would be one of the first to say, you know, hey, these kids aren't very smart. That's frustrating. How can I teach these kids and they're not very smart? And then, you know, the school, the school would say things like, you know, hey, calm down, chill, because, you know, that's really how they are. You know, they're really not that smart. So, you know, can you kind of, you know, be nice? Now, me, my, my thing is that I, if there's, if anybody ever says this is how we do things, the first thing I do is try to break that mold. I hate that. Oh no, this is always how we've done things. Oh no way. So I came in and I said, you know, wow. So we're just gonna accept that that they're not that smart. So I tried something one day, and this is, and one day I said, okay, I'll try something out. And I and I was teaching video subjects, video production subjects. I said, okay, I'll just do this. And I was talking to my colleagues. I'm going to give my students a project called the perfect project, and you're only allowed, you're only, you can only earn two possible grades, a zero or a 100. Just go two, nothing in between. You either fail or you pass spectacularly. And my colleagues would go, you know, hey, no, but wait, no, how can that happen? You mean you're going to fail? You mean you're going to give them a perfect score? I said, no, 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 no. So I told my students, I gave the assignment to my students. And the students, of course, they're going, oh my God, we're going to fail, we're going to die. You know, and, you know, you know how kids are, you know, they're going to complain first, think later. And I gave the assignment, because boys and girls, this is how it's going to work. You have two possible grades. You get a zero or you get a perfect score. Okay, I'll see you next week. And, on they, and they went their merry way. And next week, I had 20 students in that class. The project was to be done in pairs, so, so I was expecting 10 projects to be submitted. That next week, ladies and gentlemen, I received nine submissions. Nine submissions. And out of those nine submissions, five groups got a perfect score. 
five. From the same students, the people were saying they're not very smart. Five. It proved to me that they can achieve. It proved to the kids that they can achieve. It proved to everyone else that if you challenge the kids hard enough, they will achieve. It was easy for me because if all of these kids failed on that on that project, I just removed the credit. No big deal. But they achieved. And since then on for the next year, for the next year, that has become a mainstay. The kids live in fear of it, but I have an 80% perfect passing rate. The kids will achieve. So that's the end of my story. Okay? Now, let's just what's the story all about? Look at the checklist once again. I had a hero and an enemy. Who's the hero? Me. Oh, that's so self-serving. Uh, there's an enemy. Who's the enemy? The system. The world was saying that you're not smart enough. You're not good enough. And wasn't giving you a chance to succeed. And there was conflict. There were people going against me. There were, even the students were against the concept of it. They were resisting. I omitted irrelevant details. I only told you what you needed to know. I didn't drown my story in all of this flop. I told the story like I thought. Okay? So it became natural. I needed visual. I used, I used my voice. I used my hand. I, I, try, I, I described it in a way so that you can picture in your head a classroom and students there complaining and calling saying, no, don't do it. I made it personal and easy to relate to. Many of us here are teachers, so I, you know, I chose a classroom story to tell you a story about a classroom story, you know, a, a real story from a classroom. And I made it personal. It's mine. It's my experience. There's a transformation. There is a change from a, a, a you know, an institution that didn't believe in its own students to now a, to an institution that, that believes in them and challenges them to become even better than they can possibly be. Now I added spice and humor. I know used metaphor. I used action. I changed the, my voice, the way that my voice came in. I used sound effects and everything just to make it a little more interesting. And hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, you pick up clear learning moments there, some realization, some things where you, a teacher or an administrator, you're thinking, yeah, no, or maybe it's like thinking, you know, maybe have a, as an institution, as a school, as a learning place, have we been the first one to stop learning? Causes us to reflect. So there we go. The classroom story. Just follow the checklist. Cool. Cool. All right. So as I I'm now I'm now heading on the denome and I'm now heading on the downside of my of my of my lecture, okay? Remember those five story elements? I'm going back to this one slide. See. What is your story about? When you're building a story, a story for a classroom, when you're storifying your lectures, when you're storifying your, your learning activities, what is your story about? Theme. More importantly, or let's translate that now into a teacher sense, what do you want your students to understand? That's what your theme is. What is it? More importantly, or you know, just to stress it, what do you want your students to really understand? Really, what is that core knowledge? What is that very center that you want them to understand? That's what you put in the story. Because remember that facts are facts. There's no need. There's no need to, to, to you know, fluff it up. It doesn't need fluffing up. But what is it that you want them to really understand? That's what you. That's where you focus your team. This is now, you know, your core knowledge, your main lesson, your main idea. Uh, I was talking to a colleague uh, very recently, and she said, is that, is that the learning objective and all that? Yeah, learning objective, but I don't want to call it a learning objective because it's so academic. It is so institutional in nature. Sometimes a learning objective is macro. It doesn't encapsulate the tiny lesson unless you're going to put a learning objective. You know, what is that addition? What is it that you want to understand about? So what's a learning objective about addition? Gano. It's that, you know, you have, you, you, as a storyteller, if you're using a story in a classroom, you have to understand. You have to know. 
what it is that you would want your students to really understand or to pick up from that story that you're using. So yes, there is some work involved. You don't just flip on story mode and you know tell them a story about your life stories or whatever for no reason. It doesn't work that way. Because you will always go back to your theme. And what is the theme? What's the point? What's the purpose of this story that is going on? Okay? Uh, now, okay, there's 26 items in the chat because my chat window was closed. Uh, okay, I don't know if it's just me, but we're gonna see your screen for your chat. No order thinking skill to hire one thing, one fitting. Uh, did I just do that or you were requesting that Miss Jen? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so let's do this. We have a little time. Now, this is a, a storyfied challenge. Okay, uh, storyfied challenge and uh, background guys, LA, TT and all that, uh, can you back me up and I'm check the chat rooms and everything for people. This is, this is my challenge, okay? And this was part somewhere of the write-up when we were planning this first episode. My challenge, my theory is any lesson, any lesson, any classroom lesson can be storyfied. So, go, ask me to storyfy it. I'm now asking you, to give me a topic, and I will store. I will try my very best to storyify it, just to show that any classroom lesson, any classroom topic can be storyfied. Wow, what a challenge! Let me see. You can raise your hands if you want to, uh, uh, like, challenge Jag to this. Or there is place value. There was some place value. The place value. Do you know what place value is? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, actually, mas gusto kong mas gusto kong chemical bonding. <laughs> well, chemistry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. We will we will we will avoid the the mathematics. So I'll go back to the math question later. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm going to use these I'm going to use these three samples as because there's some things that I really want to emphasize. Okay, chemical bonding. I no. Okay, sorry. My, this director Mark Mealy just put up Pythagorean theorem, okay, <laughs> which which I will take on as a challenge as well because at least the Pythagorean theorem memorized for Pasha. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, okay, let's talk about chemical bonding. All right, uh, what's fact? Iba? The fact of chemical bonding is that you have the atomic numbers of these individual atoms and that depending on the atomic numbers, they either are able to bond together or require additional, bond, additional atoms to bond together. Okay? How do we storify that? How, how, do you, how do you, or how do chemicals bond or why do they get bonded together? Remember, go back to the theme or go back to what you really want them to understand. And when it comes to chemical bonding, we want them to understand that the how, the formula, is fact. So we teach them how to solve a formula there. So if you want them to understand the concept of how chemical bonds happen or how atoms or molecules happen, it's because what they're doing is they're filling in the gap. That's already, you know, using metaphor. Oh? I'm using metaphor. I'm using visual. So, for example, oxygen. Okay? The atomic number of oxygen, I actually have periodic table here beside me uh, is atomic number of 16 okay uh, with and but a single a single oxygen atom cannot actually exist because it is unstable so to create to for it to become stable you need two oxygen atoms O2 right that's because it actually wants to get to that sorry valence the last the last set of electrons wants to get to a stable number, which is 10. Okay? Now, where is it going to get 10? It's going to borrow 10 from another oxygen atom. So it's going to stick together. Friends, sila. Oh, metaphor. Okay? That other one, who also cannot exist on its own, because kulang siya ng dalawang atoms, is also going to borrow two atoms from the other O2 oxygen atom. So they're going to join together. They're going to share those two atoms there. Then they become stable. They become happy together. That's how chemical bonds happen. So a chemical is unstable when it is kulang, when it is unhappy, when it is lacking friends. So it will look, atoms and molecules will look at other atoms and molecules where it will share so that it, is, it can now become stable and happy. 
there, ladies and gentlemen, is a storified version of understanding how chemical bonds happen. Now we can start talking about the facts. This is the formula that you follow. These are the types of bonds. There are chemical bonds, uh, physical bonds. There are these kinds of bonds. But these are facts. Bam, 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 bam. But if I, if me as a student already understand how all of these different bonds work, because what they're doing is all they're also finding friends, then I understand or I was able to teach chemical bonds. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, did I did I kind of pull that off without without <laughs> totally destroying destroying things? Okay. Uh, you have one short one too. One more. One more. Okay, one more, one more. One more. One more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. theorem. Ano patulan natin si Pythagorean theorem? Math naman, maraming math teachers dito. Okay. Maraming math teachers. Okay. Well, with math teachers, uh, again, I can go back to the go back to what it is that you're trying to teach. Take a step back, okay? As a teacher, you have to detach it. If if you're if you're thinking that I have to teach them how to how to multiply, or I need to teach them, for example, uh, Pythagorean theorem, Pythagorean theorem, the, the, the. so people understand or your students understand what those concepts are. I'm not talking about how to do the formula, because that's a fact. How to solve the formula is one thing, but how to but understanding the concept of this. Um, for instance, so many of us. Including math teachers, don't don't deny it. Actually, hate algebra. Don't get it. But why do you continuously look for your x? You know why are you looking for your x? Iniwan ka nang ay kinahanap pa yung x. So, but what if we what if we transformify? We make people understand what's that? Why are we adding numbers? Why are we multiplying numbers? Because the concept of variables wasn't problem, properly explained. So let's explain you now that x is an unknown. We have, when you say x squared plus, uh, or x plus y, what you're basically saying is unknown number one and we added to unknown number two. So what if unknown number one is, who is that girl? Ooh. And then, oh, she has a friend. Who is her, who's her friend? Now we're talking about x and y. So you see now how that simple analogy how that simple visualization allows me now to understand what X and Y means. I may still have a problem with doing trinomials and, and extrapolation, but at least I understand now why, why I can add X plus Y plus A plus B. Because I'm not adding letters, pala, I'm adding unknown. So when we talk about the Pythagorean theorem, for instance, Pythagorean theorem basically is, 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 a, is a theorem, which means you're proving it constantly, which means that there is somebody in the in the universe who thinks that that formula is wrong. C squared is equal is equal to A squared plus B squared. Somebody said that's wrong. And the, and the whole world is now currently trying to prove it wrong. But what the Pythagorean theorem basically means is, is that whenever you have one angle that is up and an angle that is 90 degrees like this, that means that the, the, the square of this, this times this, plus this times this, if you add the two, that will always be or open to this. Regardless of how long this is and how long that is, it will always be this times this, plus this times this, is equal to this times this. When I say storify, okay, uh, when I say when it is storify, you do not have to always go Jack and Jill went up the hill. You don't always have to have a oh, little Pedro wanted to go to the farm. It, this is not this is not always about about creating a you know a once upon a time story. When we say story fire, when I say story fire, it's I want you to 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 language your facts, to language your 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 learning your learning activities, your learning moments into a form that is digestible here and here. Because this is where we understand. Here we just know. Here is where we understand. So if you want people to understand concepts, you want them to understand um, martial law. Okay, and this is, I'm trying not to be political about this, but, but think martial law. Okay, and it's pretty relevant, especially for those that are teaching high school and college students. Ha. On September 21, 1972, President Ferdinand Marcos uh, issued Presidential Decree 1081 putting the whole country under martial law, period. That's a fact. You cannot dispute that. Even the Marcos kids cannot dispute that. It's a fact. 
And then we're going to complain as adults, oh, kids don't know what martial law means. They're forgetting what it meant to suffer and why. Because it's not, it wasn't, it was never here. Martial law was always here. What does martial law mean? So we start to tell them about the injustices that were done. We start to tell them to make them understand about the corruption. You want students to understand in a classroom what it means to be martial law? You as a teacher, why don't you say something inherently wrong? Two plus two is equal to five. And when somebody says, uh, excuse me, po, ma'am, mali po yan, send them to the principal's office because that's what martial law is. Then it becomes real. They become castigated for speaking out against what's wrong. Where does that affect them? Does it affect them here? No, it affects them here. And once it affects them here, it affects their whole being. So which means so that students, that students might fail. It might say September 27 on declaration. So Malaysia the exam, but he knows what martial law is about. He understands what they you know. And so that's so that when you talk about learning, the learning becomes richer, becomes deeper. So once again, whether we're talking about mathematics, we're talking about social studies, we're talking about children in Marawi, or we're talking to preschoolers, or we're talking to postgraduate students. When you storyify and you storyify properly and you as a teacher understand what it is that you're trying to to, to, to communicate then that learning embeds itself here. It carries itself longer. Again, which is why you still remember your end, even if you don't remember your calculus exam. Okay? So <laughs> uh, good yan jaga. Huh? Oh, I don't remember I don't remember my ex. I don't know who they are anymore. <laughs> Just the why. Uh, the, just, just the, the wife, wife. <laughs> the wife I mean the wife yeah the, yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, the wife is the wife is at the center of my universe uh, Jack, uh, last words or anything okay. yeah well um, what is it yeah well that's basically it um, that's that's the formal end of my talk my my lecture uh, you know again going back to that at the at the at the end of it all when you know when you're telling your story because this is the easy part ladies and gentlemen as filipinos and as asians in general but, but particularly filipinos you know that's why we're not very good in sciences and math i mean come on hard facts we're not it's not our thing why because our societal dna the makeup the physical and and and, and structural makeup of the filipino is literary we are a literary race, uh, race. We are not a computational. That's why we're not. That's why there's such a thing as Filipino time. We cannot, for the life of us, do anything on time or de cajon because we are our the very fiber of our being is embedded in literature and oral storytelling. Love to tell stories and we can easily tell stories. Look at our news. When nothing is happening in our lives, we create drama. Our news has to be dramatic because if it's not dramatic, if it's factual, Filipinos shut off, shut down. So it's easy for us to tap into our innate ability to tell stories, to engage people. Just put structure, put learning activities, and then there you go. You have stories that work, stories that matter, stories that change life, stories that matter. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, thank you, Jack. You know what? Uh, Jack will stay. We will just end this part. Yeah. So those who want, like, you have another, we have another 15 minutes later after this closing because people might need to go. So Abby, uh, but we're we're letting Jack stay for those who want to continue a little bit and ask him questions. But uh, we'll just close this a bit so that others can can go if they really need to go. And we have some more announcements, Abby. Right. Okay. Thank you, Jag. I feel super activated to actually practice this in my class. I did before, but not on this scale. Um, I like that whole part of the, the chemistry thing. I think I can include that in social innovation uh, stories. So let me do that one. Um, I hope I hope everyone is able to uh, get so much value from this one because I did. Um, after all, you know, stories are very powerful. Just like Jag said. Um, they have the ability to connect with our audience. And I think, based on the on your registration answers, a lot of the teachers, our challenge, um, even though that's also our bright spot, is that we need to build this connection, this um, engagement with our students. So, this, since that is the ultimate objective, I hope we could really use storyfying strategy to connect with our, with our students. Um, I have a few things here. 
Um, in the breakout room earlier, I was just I just want to make mention. So there was A's eyes in the room. Uh, she works in the library and she super agrees with the power of storytelling. So she would uh, she would actually you know difficult books or maybe thick ones. What she will do is just package it in a short story and then pitch it to the students. So they will really uh, borrow the book. So I think I think that's super important. So this is not just in the in the classroom, but also in several aspects of, of the academic uh, environment or learning. Um, also, I want to give a brief shout out to those who I've uh, interfaced with in the in the breakout room. Uh, teachers from St. Michael Academy in Legazpi. So apparently, um, just to give a, a context to everyone in the audience, we have we have teachers who are using one account. So one account and many teachers in St. Michael's Academy, they're in the library. So oh, they're all viewing hi, everyone. this one. <laughs> yeah, they're viewing this one as a group. So hi, everyone. I hope the connection was good and you're able to get a lot from this one. So um, as part of the live ed is that we want to continue connecting with you. We want to keep the communication lines open. Um, we will do this one by reaching out to you. Um, we're hoping that, you know, you gave a lot of suggestions on how, on what could be storified. Um, so we, we want to we wanna, we wanna flip the, the conversation is that, could you try storifying it? Um, if yes, and if you're able to do that, we're hoping that you could share your experience in storifying these uh, these topics that you that you mentioned in the in the chat. Um, so we will be reaching out to you, and we will be asking, and we we'll see how we could cover this one, so we could share with the broader audience on how you use storifying in your classroom, or maybe even the library, or any aspect of the academic services, for that matter. Um, another thing is that. Um, so check your email. In, in a span of two weeks, we will be connecting with you. Also, we would appreciate if we could get feedback from you. Um, this, so this is a pilot run and we want to continue to improve things. So I, 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 I have a sense that um, a lot of you were so happy with the, with the breakout room function. Um, yeah, it's super good. It's, it's super good for group work and collaborative work. So we don't just uh, focus on just the lecture. Um, so yeah, we want to improve. Um, so we are posting the link to the feedback form. If you could, if you could do that, please. If you could quickly, it's a simple feedback form. If you could uh, help us um, improve this one or give us feedback or thoughts on how you find live ed pilot run. So we would be very happy with that. Also, one more thing, housekeeping here. Huh? <laughs> um, also, because you give us feedback and you would share with us your stories. Uh, on how you use this uh, this technique of storifying. Our gift to you in return also is that we will give you um, an attendance certificate, participation, a certificate of participation. And we will do this one via email. So we will send you the certificate also. Uh, so please wait for that. I, I know how important that is. Um, uh, a lot of the comments in the chat also, since this is being recorded, we will process this one. Um, and then we will share it also. We will share it with you. So you watch out for the email as well where we, and we will give the links. Um, but also, it would be very good as well if you have access to Facebook um, or other social media platforms like um, Instagram or LinkedIn, whatever it is that you use. I think also Twitter. Um, so the Hi-Fi team is actually posting the links to our social media channels. If you could please like and follow um, you could also see that the materials that we did for, for, for live ed will be pushed there or posted there. We will also, for, the, some, for those who don't have Facebook, um, we do have YouTube channels. So we will put that in there as well. But if you get lost in all these announcements, it's okay. It will be emailed to you. Okay. Um, anything else that I need to say for this part? Um, I think that's it from my end, Brother okay. Dennis. Abi, Abi, yeah. Uh... Speaking about continued engagement, we would like to journey you to journey with us in this live ed. Uh, so we will have more episodes actually. Uh, mm. Soon we will. I mean, we were thinking of having. I mean, audio podcast. Those things you might be. Uh, you might be interested because you you will need you will need that soon for those in the public school, for example. Uh, you might be using radio or TV or any other forms to reach out to your students. So preparing podcasts or audio materials 
might be another way of putting your stories into audio format. Now, isn't that exciting? So that's, even that's the next level. We're not any more concerned about should we go online or not? No, you will always be online or at least in blended learning in the coming months or years. Also, we will be talking about maybe we're thinking of inviting people who are good with drama or even K-drama and to say, hey, how, how do we use that for class? The things that we are we are so excited about on a daily basis, can, how can they be used in class? That's that's those, those in the future we'll be dealing with that. We'll be dealing with artists in uh, in, in dance and many other forms of uh, artistry. And how do we bring this to the classroom, or how they can help you as basic as teachers or even the tertiary level to use these skills, new skills that they will share with you uh, in the coming months. So uh, it will not end here. June, July, August, September, November those months we will probably have one uh one episode each so and bro uh, i think we may have a repeat also on uh, story month. by yeah. if by popular demand <laughs> yeah if you say that in the feedback and you you want your friends to join in those who did not make it today we'll have that available okay so now what we will do is uh so see some people are interested some people from uh or some from, from the polo even are, are here uh i'd like to now give you a chance for those of you who need to go you are okay you can go but for those of you who would like imagine this as our superstar our speaker just went out into the lobby of a big <laughs> uh, big big forum uh, like the PICC and now he's just there standing aside from having your picture taken you want to ask him questions now is the time and we will have this until 12 o'clock uh, just go you have questions or you want you can put the questions there in the in the in the chat if you, you so you can uh, we can now start Jack where are you yeah, Jack? I'm here I'm here somewhere okay I'm, I'm hanging around in the lobby 